Really? Say again? I, I drove these roads 20 years ago. You? Yes. Yeah. 1993. 1993, yes. There is a great deal of killing, a whole lot of violence in the movie Black Hawk Down. But to be honest with you, it is a fraction of what really happened in Somalia. If you look at all the bullet holes around here, most of these are from us. Life and death became a lot less significant for me in Mogadishu. I don't know if that's a piece of me that's still over there. I don't know if that's something that I left there. I don't know if that's just who I am now. I don't know the answer to that. It was my job to lead the Humvees on all of the missions that Task Force Ranger did in Somalia. For the first 30 minutes, man, this thing went down like clockwork, except for one of the Rangers who was flying in on the Blackhawks. Todd Blackburn, when he left the Blackhawk to slide down the rope, he missed the rope, and he fell somewhere between 70 and 90 feet from the helicopter. So as soon as I got to the target building, I was already getting a call to take Todd Blackburn back to the base and drop him off. And when I turned the corner, I got hit with the most intense enemy gunfire I've ever experienced in my life. In the course of one or two city blocks, Dominic Pillow was killed behind me, and most of the vehicles were shot to pieces. For the first time, I started to panic, and everybody around me started to panic. And I was thinking, I know I'm going to die. When I finally made it back to the airfield, I was surprised that any of us survived. In fact, I took my helmet off and I threw it. I was so angry at what I just went through, threw it across the blacktop. And that's almost the exact moment that my platoon leader said, Jeff, Mike Durant's helicopter's crashed in the city and we don't have anybody else who can go back out there. I need you to get your men, get back on the Humvees, and go back out to the Durant crash site and see if anybody's alive there. I started to clean the blood and the brain matter off of the sides of this Humvee, getting ready to go back out into the city streets. And I was listening over the radio as this operation was spinning out of control and people's voices were getting more and more terrified. I started thinking about my family. I started thinking, God, I'm gonna die in the next few minutes. Everything inside of me was thinking, don't go back out there. So at that point, I just kept doing what I was doing and I started praying, God, I'm in big trouble now and I know I'm gonna die and I need your help whatever you want to happen to me tonight God I'm putting my life and my future in your hands it was in an instant as soon as I said that I was still totally convinced that I was gonna die but from that moment the rest of the night I didn't fear death at all I think that is the only thing that gave me the courage to get on Humvees and drive back out in the city streets repeatedly What nobody has done at this point from Task Force Ranger who was in Somalia, nobody's gone back there. A good friend of mine, Kenny Thomas, who is in Somalia with me, called me out of the blue and said, Jeff, are you interested in going to Somalia? And I was the one telling Kenny, do you realize how dangerous Somalia and specifically how dangerous Mogadishu is? And he said, look, man, I'm willing to go if you're willing to go. I don't feel much emotional difference today than I did flying into Mogadishu 20 years ago. It doesn't feel like it's been that long. I haven't specifically thought of what it's going to be like, you know, for me personally or emotionally or psychologically going back over there. Probably haven't thought about it on purpose. I'm the security supervisor uh, here at Mogadishu for SKA. The situation in Mogadishu is, I can say, it's not any better. There's a lot more activity still happening. IEDs, roadside, grenade attack, uh, drive-by shooting, is still happening. I will not advise that we go into Makara area. Hey, I'll see you on the other side, man. Hi, Rainy.
Okay, Jeff, uh, do you recognize anything yet? All right, so anything on your right should be the Wolcott crash site, and right up here where those trees are to your left should be the Durant crash site. I was parked right here. In fact, I can still recognize some of those buildings that I spent the whole night parked in front of. So this is how you came in to get us, right? That's right. I think if you bang a right up here by this large five-story building, you're gonna get real close to the original Target building. Oh, Jeff, tell the driver we're gonna, we're gonna go right. All right, we got it. Take it right. Roger. Hey, Kenny, you know that we're in the Bacara market right now, right? Acutely. This is what the roads look like with people, except for the people all had guns. You're in the area of town that everybody said don't go into right now. Because it's very dangerous. Hey Jeff, let's just tell the team we're gonna find our way out of here pretty quick. Yeah, sounds good. Hey, will you call them and tell them to go north to um to whatever and then let's go back down to your list? In front of ministry. No, don't turn back. Tell them to go north, hit uh, 21 October and go down via Lynn. A roadblock? It's okay, keep going, keep going. You're good. It is? That's your house? <laughs> yeah. My house. Hey, we did a lot of shooting back here 20 years ago by your house. Is this Hobbledig? Yeah, Hobbledig. Yeah, okay. We got into a big firefight right here, man. I drove down a narrow alleyway next to the Target building, and then I made a right turn onto that road. And when I made a right turn onto that road, that's where I got hit with about a couple of hundred to a thousand enemy fighters within a few city blocks. That's where Dominic Pilla was killed. That's where the majority of the initial firefight that I experienced was there. And to this day, it's still the most intense firefight I've ever been in. What I remember thinking distinctly when we were driving back into the city the second and third time is, okay, I know I'm gonna die, but I know where I'm gonna spend my eternity. Now I just need to do everything necessary to make sure that my men don't die. I can't believe I survived that. Good gracious. There's no real explanation why I'm standing here right now. Today, driving back through the city streets, I think that's as close as I've come to the feelings of Somalia 20 years ago in Black Hawk Down. And today really, really drove this home for me when this firefight was over with, a lot of guys were coming up to my little cot saying, you've got something that I don't have. What is it? You, you, you were able to do something that I wasn't able to do. I could hear it in your voice over the radio. What is it? I was very calm. I had made peace with God. I was ready to die in the next few moments. And it influenced the way that I fought. And seeing that spot today, where I washed the blood out of the back of the Humvees and where God gave me the sense of peace has reminded me that death really became less significant to me in Somalia. And I wonder if life and death here on earth became less significant because eternity became so much more real to me in Somalia. The very fact that I'm standing here in Mogadishu, Somalia, 20 years after the Battle of Black Hawk Down is conclusive proof that Jesus is real and that faith in Jesus Christ will make all of the difference in your life. When these warriors were coming up to me and asking me questions, and these are some of the toughest men on the planet, asking me questions about life and death. Jeff, what happened to my best friend who just died? And Jeff, what happens to me if I get on a helicopter or a Humvee? My answer to all of them was the same. 
If you put your faith in Jesus Christ, whatever happens to you here on planet Earth, He's with you. And when you die, death is not the end for somebody who has faith in Jesus Christ. It's the beginning. It's a door you walk through, and He's waiting for you with eternity on the other side. So I would tell those men, listen, here's the deal. All of us are born into sin. And the consequences of sin, the Bible is very clear about this, is death. Sin equals death. And having committed one sin, one time, you deserve to die. In fact, the Bible says in John chapter 8 that if you sin, you become a slave to sin and you can't earn your way free. So I try to tell those guys, look, you can't go to church enough to become free from your sin. You can't work hard enough to get freedom from your sin. You can't give money. You can't read the Bible. You can't even pray hard enough to earn your freedom from your sin. It's, you're shackled to it. And there's no way you can become free unless God steps in and does something. Then I explain to those guys, the answer is that Jesus Christ, God's only son, was willing to leave heaven, lived a perfect life, willing to go to the cross, and the only man who never deserved to die died in your place and in my place so that your sins could be paid for once and for all. But not only did he die, three days later he rose again so that death would no longer have hold on anybody who has faith in Jesus Christ. And then I told him, if you will turn your heart and surrender your soul to your Creator, to Jesus Christ, he will radically transform your life like he did mine. And you'll never have to worry about what life is going to throw at you next. Because now you've got a friend who sticks closer than a brother. You, now you have somebody who will never bail on you when life gets tough. And no matter how bad your future gets, he will be right there with you. And he will get you through whatever life is throwing at you next. And that and that alone settles once and for all where you stand with God and what your eternity is going to be like. But then I'd also tell him, if you turn around and you walk away from this, and don't turn it all over to Jesus Christ. The consequences for that is that you spend an eternity separated from God from ever. You'll spend an eternity in hell. And now the ball's in your court. What do you want to do about it? And I had a number of men who sat down next to me and surrendered their life to Jesus Christ in a simple prayer. The prayer was something like, God, I admit it. I've made a mess of my life. I'm a sinner and I don't deserve to go to heaven. But I believe you sent your son Jesus who died in my place. I believe that three days later he rose again and right here where I'm sitting, I'm turning my life and my future over to you. I trust you with whatever happens to me next. That's the kind of prayer that I prayed when God radically transformed my life through faith in Jesus. And God transformed a lot of those guys who survived Somalia with me through faith in Jesus and he can do the exact same thing for you.